I'd like to thank the entire organizers and uh, Dr. Bansi, Dr. Arvind, Dr. Manoj, Dr. Bharat, all of whom have done an incredible job of putting this meeting together. I'm going to speak a little bit today about new insulins in the hospital setting. Uh, we know that once a patient is in the hospital and is going to stay there for a longer period of time, more than a day, then most of our patients are going to be on insulin therapy. The choice is which one should we use and is there an advantage of using newer insulin in the hospital environment? So I'm just going to review some of the data and show you that what would be an optimum case setting where perhaps you know new insulins may be of use to us. Uh, this is a data by Dr. Umpiraz and they just randomly looked at patients who came to the hospital and how many patients were kind of newly detected. And they found to the surprise that almost about 12% of the patients who came into the hospital were patients who did not know that they had diabetes. Now, since they had not done the admission A1C, whether they were undetected or newly detected for the first time in the hospital were not known. But a large percentage of the people who come into the hospital do yeah, I mean, we should be testing the blood glucose and HbA1c as a random because it helps us to detect undetected diabetes. Now, why is it so important that new onset hyperglycemia should have so much of importance? And if you look at this data from the mortality statistics in the hospital, patients with new onset hyperglycemia in the hospital tend to have a worse outcome as compared to patients who wouldn't did not have hyperglycemia or were established patients with diabetes. Because it stands to reason that patients who develop new onset hyperglycemia are more sicker patients and they tend to, I mean, hyperglycemia is a marker of, you know, a sick patient. So because of insulin resistance, they tend to get hyperglycemic. Now, if you fail to identify hyperglycemia, during the hospitalization, the rehospitalization rates of these patients tend to be three times as higher than the patients who were detected to have diabetes. So it is imperative that every patient of ours should be screened for presence of hyperglycemia in the hospital. This was a paper that you know we had published the RSSDI in patient guidelines in 2016 and which has a lot of literature about how do we manage patients in the hospital. And I have Dr. Makkar and so many of our friends over here who have been part of this writing committee of the guidelines and I'm sure that it will be a very useful document for you to keep with you, all those who are managing patients in the hospital. Now, when we look at patients in the hospital, the patients who come into the critical care units, more often than not, we tend to use IV insulins in these patients, particularly when they're on multiple you know, organ problems. So these patients are generally on IV insulins. But when we transition them into the non-critical care areas, we move them on to most often than not a basal bolus treatment, subcutaneous therapy. And at the time of discharge, you may just continue with the basal bolus or some of us tend to move them also into premix, but that depends on case to case. But most of the patients will go home on a basal bolus therapy. Uh, this was the protocol that we advocated in our inpatient guidelines, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, but basically you give a priming bolus, and then depending on how much of blood glucose drop that you get, you can do a dose escalation in a very structured manner, looking at how much the blood glucose values are. And you obviously need to go from one column to the other, depending on how the response of the blood glucose is to the IV insulin dose that you're giving. So if you follow this algorithm, you'll be probably more or less coming to reasonable control but don't take it as a dogma that you have to follow this. You have to use your own logic to go up and down in terms of your dose requirements. Uh, so this is also how, you know, hypoglycemia should be managed. It's not random how much, you know, glucose that you give the patient in, the, in case the patient is going low. There is a structured way how much of dextrose infusion that you need to give the patient. All those where insulin pumps are not available, this was the algorithm that we gave for a drip set, how much of drips that you, how much drops of, you know, per minute that you need to give the patient for dose titration. 
Remember the world over dextrose insulin drips have been given up. So we don't give any more dextrose insulin drips for the variability of the amount of insulin that the patient will tend to get. Now, I just want to make this sort of a premise that when you give any insulin intravenously, it behaves like a regular insulin. So please remember this. And we have data to prove that. So, you know, if you look at even Clargene, you look at any other insulins, when injected intravenously, they all behave like a short-acting insulin. It's only when you inject subcutaneously that their absorptive patterns tend to change in terms of whether they're intermediate acting or long acting in that sense because of the excipient that they carry with them. But all intravenous insulins, irrespective of which one, and we have data, this is a paper that was put out by Dr. Sundar Mudliar and his group where they compared IV glargine and regular insulin and they said that they have similar effects on the endogenous glucose output and peripheral activation or deactivation. And you can see here the mean suppression of the you know, hepatic glucose output between uh, glargine and regular insulin was very similar in curves almost overlapping each other and if you look at the peripheral disposal rates they were very similar between IV glargine and regular insulin so they have actually shown that they have very similar properties as this now do we have the clinical data to show similarity of effects and you can see here clearly that they looked at analog insulin so this was not glargine but this was short acting analog insulin versus human insulin. So is there an advantage of using analog insulin intravenously over regular insulins? And these were tested in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis by Dr. Umpiraz and his group. And what they did show was that the time to resolution of the ketoacidosis was very similar uh, between the two groups. So there's no clear advantage of using IV analog insulin as compared to regular insulins. It's just the cost difference that you load the patient with. So if you look at the response rates, you can see here that admission it was 520 odd. At the start of infusion, 400 odd. At the time of resolution, it was 153, 185. The duration of insulin infusion is very similar and time to resolution was again very similar. So there is no advantage of using IV analog insulin as compared to regular. Uh, but when they were transitioned into the wards and when you give a basal bolus, when you give basal bolus with analog versus basal bolus with regular insulins, there is a definite reduction in the hypoglycemia rates. So subcutaneously, there is a definite advantage of using analogs over a regular insulin. And you can see here the percentage of patients who are less than 70 and less than 40 were much lower in the glargine glue lysine group as compared to the NPH and the regular insulin groups. So it was concluded that regular and glue lysine insulin are equally effective in terms of acute treatment of DK, but transition to subcute glargine and glue lysine following resolution of DK resulted in similar glycemic control but lower rates of hypoglycemia. Uh, this was again another paper where they looked at acute treatment of a DK and conventionally what we give is the IV insulin protocol. Now Dr. Umpiraz and his group again compared IV uh, insulin versus subcutaneous insulin as part. So can you give every hourly or every two hourly subcutaneous as part as compared to IV insulin? And look at the results what they found that again time to resolution was very very similar. So if you give subcut as part versus IV insulin. But the advantage being that when you give these patients subcutaneous you can treat them in the wards you don't need to keep them in the ICUs if they are stable patients. So you can compare the length of ICU stay, very similar hospital, hospitalization rates were much lower, uh, sorry, hospital charges was much lower in the subcute as part. So, you know, you can give this as an option. The only thing caveat that you have to be very careful is patients who are underhydrated or severely dehydrated and you give them subcute as part insulins. There is a small chance of a dumping that may happen once you rehydrate the patient. Because the circulation is lower, so there's not so much of absorption happening from the subcute space. 
So when you suddenly hydrate the patient, there may be a sudden absorption and there may be a dumping, but it's not so much frequent. So when I spoke to Dr. Yumpiraz, they said that they re really did not see so much of hypoglycemia rates with rehydration therapy. So that is a small point of concern that you need to be very careful as to how much of part and how much frequently are you giving the patient. We have to follow the basic principles of transition when you transfer from IV to subcute. Remember that you have to overlap the insulin because IV insulin has a half-life of only about 10 minutes. So the moment you stop the IV insulin, it disappears from the circulation. So you have to first give the subcute insulin and after about you know two hours or so, you need to stop the IV insulins. So that is a point of uh, you know, your orders that you need to give your hospital uh, patients. These are sort of target goals that we need to keep in the non-ICU. We are giving fasting of less than 120, pre-meal targets of less than 140, random of less than 180. Now, this was the recommendation that our group gave in the RSSJ guidelines and Manoj also is part of that. He's sitting over here. So, Manoj acknowledged the fact that you get, did a great job in setting up these guidelines. So, thank you. So, this is the you know, algorithm that we followed for the subcute guidelines dosage. And we always need to do a basal and a bolus plus correction boluses. So, that, you know, if you find that whatever calculation of basal you do and the bolus, but your target post meal targets are not at goal, then you have to give a correction boluses. And the calculation for the correction bolus is mentioned out there, but lack of time, I don't want to dwell on it. But the guideline paper is there, and you can certainly refer to it and tell you, you know, how to calculate the correction boluses. And again, on a day to day basis, we need to calculate the total daily, do daily dose requirement. So if you are at goal, you can continue the previous day's dose. If you are not at goal and you most of the day you tend to be hyperglycemic, then you add another 10% or 20% to the uh, total daily dose and recalculate your basal and bolus. If you are experiencing hypoglycemias during the course of the day, then you are obviously overcorrecting it and you need to come down in terms of your total daily dose by 10 or 20% and then recalculate your basal boluses. So which is a good insulin formulation in the subcute in the non critical care areas and here you have the dean's trial which compared the detimerous part versus nph and regular and you can clearly see here the glycemia status is very very similar between the two groups and you can see from this graphs over here they're almost overlapping but what is important is again the hypoglycemia rate so you can see the percentage of people who had mild hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia were much lower in the analog group as compared to the human insulins uh, this was another paper which looked at mean daily blood glucose levels versus premix 3070 and you can clearly see here that there is an overlap in terms of glycemia control. But again, what is important is the hypoglycemia rates. The group that received the basal bolus had much lower hypoglycemia as compared to the premix. So in the hospital environment, a basal bolus is much better as compared to premix. Now, it is also important to realize that in the hospital environment, there's a lot of fluctuation in terms of timing of the meal, the amount of food that the patient is going to consume. And that's where your short acting analog insulin comes very much to your rescue, where you can inject and eat or eat and inject. And they are very rapid on the onset of action. So you can actually time how much the patient is going to eat and give appro appropriate doses to the patient. So, and again, patients who are renally compromised, where you may have a delayed excretion and a prolonged action of the insulin, that's where your analog insulin may be of much value in terms of getting you better control with lower rates of hypoglycemia. Uh, this was, uh, you know, we always keep referring the gold standard is glargine when it comes to giving patients in the hospital environment. But can we use degludac, which is an ultra long acting insulin, because we know that the dose stabilization takes almost about 72 hours. So this was a paper that was you know, this is released, this information has been released by, uh, by Novo Nordisk, and I'm just giving the slides that have been sort of, you know, put out in the public domain by Novo Nordisk. But they did this IDEOS study, which compared Degludac versus uh, Glargine. And what they did show was that the mean reduction of, you know, capillary glycemia was much lower with the Degludac group as compared to the Glargine group.
And if you look at patients at target on day one and the time of discharge, and they looked at the continuous glucose monitoring before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, and at bedtime, clearly you can see that the Deglodac group had much better glycemia control as compared to the Glargine group. So Deglodac can be given in the hospital environments. It's not only Glargine. So this was a paper that gave you the you know, the study which compared Glargine and the Deglodac. And you can see the, again the Deglodac in terms of control of the fasting and pre-dinner values had much better control as compared to Glargine. Percentages of hypoglycemia rates were low in the Deglodac group. So this was one trial that compared Deglodac versus Glargine. This was another one that looked at, this was not a Novo sponsored trial, this was an independent trial. And you can see here the mean daily blood glucose concentrations and mean blood glucose before meals and at bedtime were almost overlapping between the Glargine group and the Deglodac group. I just want to end up my talk by giving some of the discharge recommendations. So you always keep reviewing the self-management with the patient. Issue a discharge summary with clear instructions. Discuss the prescribed drugs in terms of their des descriptions, dosages, and possible adverse events. Instruct on the home blood glucose monitoring and ask them to keep a proper record so that when they come to you, you can analyze it and give them how much of insulin dose. Remember that I, as a person, Never give a very tight control at the time of discharge because when the patient goes home, his requirement tends to come down because his stress levels are down, he's eating in a more structured manner, all kinds of things. And invariably, when you give a very tight glycemic control at the time of discharge, the patient tends to experience hypoglycemias. So it's more prudent in a practical sense to keep them slightly hyperglycemic at the time of discharge and then sort of recalibrate the dosing once they come back to you on a follow-up visit. This was the recommendation of the discharge protocol. If the patient previously diagnosed and less than 8%, you continue the pre-discharge medications. If it was more than 8% A1C before the, uh, admission, then you intensify the treatment. If there was no A1C available, but the patient had a good glycemic control in the hospital, reintroduce pre-admission protocols. If the patient had poor glycemic control, it's time to intensify the pre-admission protocol. Again, if the patient was previously undiagnosed and the A1C was between 6.5 and 7, lifestyle modification, metformin, follow-up. If the patient had A1C of more than 7%, then you start treatment with whatever, OHAs, insulin, whatever you prefer. And in patients who had a stress hyperglycemia, invariably patients when they go home and they become normal glycemic, 30 to 40 percent of these patients tend to become hyperglycemic at a later point of time. So your screening programs should be in place to see that you don't miss a late onset of hyperglycemia or over diabetes in these patients. So concludingly, hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for poor clinical outcome in multiple patient populations. Tight glycemic control improves mortality and morbidity and reduces the cost in critically ill patients. We do not yet know what should be the optimum glycemic goals. Hospitalization is an opportunity to assess glycemic control and intensify outpatient therapy. And the barriers to good control is the gap between what we know and what we do. I'd like to pay you know, my respects to Dr. Umpiraz, who's been an excellent teacher, but most of the studies that come from in hospital comes from this great man. So thank you very much for your patient listening.